like I tell people all the time, you can't strengthen a muscle you can't find. Right. You can't find the muscle. How do you hope to strengthen it? You're not, if you don't have access to it because your skeletal position or your, autono or your autonomics or your basal ganglia says no, well, you can't, you can't strengthen it. It's impossible to strengthen it. Right. If you, your brain has to allow it. It has to permit it. Your brain is going to say no or not say no. So it's either going to inhibit or not inhibit. And yeah. if it's fearful, it's not going to let it happen. Yeah. And yeah. so that's a good segue. I don't know how much time you have, but. I got time, yeah. Okay. So we were yeah. talking about power lifters. Because yeah. yeah. I, I, apparently I have a bunch of power lifters who watch my <laughs> channel. They don't really comment very often, but when I do sessions with them, they're like, oh yeah, we, we all watch your stuff. So, but you have a lot yeah. of um, experience with power lifters. Yeah. 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 There's a, a, a power. I was fortunate enough to, to get involved with a, a powerlifting gym that they have me out a couple times a year to look at not only their individual clients, but to just give some PRI background information because the guy who runs the gym, um, I've seen him a couple of different times and, and he's taken some PRI courses and uh, uh, 2XL powerlifting and Lombard. So it's a, they just moved into a new, new space and they got great people down there. And and so I've been fortunate enough to, to work with some people from that gym and some from other gyms as well. And, and the, the challenge, so, you, so usually when, by the time a power lifter comes to, to seek my help yeah. face to face is for one of two reasons, either they're broken, so they've injured themselves in some form or fashion, or they're frustrated because they aren't making the kind of progression in strength that they want to have. They've kind of feel like they've plateaued and they're not continuing to improve. And so that's usually one of the two reasons is why I end up seeing them. So, and, it, and um, if they are injured, then there's, it's an easier sell then because yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta tell them, listen, you gotta, you gotta stop working out for a period of time. We gotta fix some stuff. If they're frustrated because they've plateaued, the challenge then is to tell them, you gotta give me a couple of weeks of you not working out. Mm, which is not what they want to That's not where they're there, exactly. They're not there to not work out, right. you know? And so the, one of the first thing they do is just kind of show them stuff they can't do. Like you're a big, strong girl or guy. You've seen the inside of a weight room. Why can't you do this? Yeah. Why can't you do this? What, what would be one of those things? So in a lot of times I'll start with some, just some passive testing, like this modified overs or what we call here an adductor drop test. Mm -hmm. huh, why doesn't your leg move? Why do you have that kind of inflexibility? Oh no, my hips are very flexible. This test tells me that you're not. So that's interesting. Uh, what's what about your hip rotation? Huh? Why don't your hips rotate one direction or both directions? Interesting. Okay. Um, well, let's uh, let's have you lay on your side. Let's see what you can do from the frontal plane. Okay. I know you're really good. You know, extension and flexion, extension going this way. What happens if you go sideways? So I'll just put your leg up on my shoulder. Shoulder. I'll do an adduction lift test. They can't do it. You know, it's like a. It's great on a scale of five. They have like a zero. Like they physically can't even get in the position to, to warrant a test on either side. Like, so explain to me then how you can squat 400 pounds, but you can't lift your leg. Like that's eye opening. How, can you explain how that works to me? And they're like, I don't know. I'm like, well, I do. Well, let's, let me answer that for you. Yeah. And so then I have the conversation of, the, the challenge with the powerlifting crowd, and really, I would say this goes for a lot of other, a, a lot of other, a lot of other athletic endeavors other than powerlifting. Right, but right. the challenge is that they are living their life as if they are squatting 400 pounds currently. So I mean, they're keeping their frame, their skeleton, in the same kind of extended, hyperinflated position that they would be if they were in the squat rack or deadlifting or even bench pressing for that matter. Because when they bench press, they arc their back and they start yeah. to push yeah. up. Yeah. So they're yeah. maximizing that extension, which is fantastic if you're lifting that kind of weight. And right. so the, the, the huge, like it takes like a, day, a session or two to be able to educate them that you really have to have two lives. You have to have a gym life and you have to have a non-gym life. Now, the non-gym life is like, 93% of your life and the gym life is like 7% of your life. The problem is you're doing everything like you're in the gym. You're sitting like you're in the gym. You're walking like you're in the gym in this extended posture. So the, the challenge is to explain to them that you don't need this kind of thoracic lumbar pelvis extension unless you're lifting a lot of weight because gravity shouldn't warrant this kind of postural activity. Aside from the fact that 
It is compression to your spine. It's compression to your discs all the time. It's compression to your vertebrae. It is compressing your airway. It is changing your, sympath your parasympathetic tone to increase sympathetic tone. It's changing your hormone levels. It's negatively influencing your ability to, to, your ability to respire or exchange air. It's changing the chemistry because now you have excessive oxygen and not enough carbon dioxide in your system does because carbon dioxide is a necessity. Carbon dioxide is the trigger to tell you to inhale. Well, if you don't have carbon dioxide, then your inhalation just gets more and more rapid because there is no trigger to tell you to inhale. So you're like, well, let's just inhale anyway. Right. So all these things, you, I'm not trying to go into that kind of detail with them, but I'm just trying to explain to them that you have to have two lives and the life you need to spend most of your time in, what I call is Bruce Wayne. Yes. You need to be that parasympathetic, chill, relax, just kind of let it go to preserve your Batman energy for when it's time to be Batman. And Batman is powerlifting. Batman is playing basketball. Pat, Batman is running. Batman is sprinting. Batman is doing all those powerful, explosive, dynamic things that should require some mode of extension to do. So extension is awesome when you need it, but you shouldn't have to be in extension to bend over and pick up your keys off the ground. <laughs> which, which anyone who knows they've had SI joint issues, that's how you usually get hurt. Absolutely. And completely that's, innocuous. Right. Because I'm sure you get this all the time as well as, all I did is just bent over to tie my shoes and my back locked up and I was in bed for three days. Well, it wasn't that thing. It was because you've done that in extension a thousand times. Yeah. And eventually your body finally just says, I'm done. I've had enough. I'm out. You got to lay down in two days because I need a break. I got to stop being Batman for two days. Mm -hmm. And so what I usually have them do is I do the power lifts. I try to get them into some kind of more or some, type, some kind of non-extended position. Could be hands and knees, could be a modified squat, could be you know a standing bar reach is something we do in PRI to get their rib cage, get them to exhale and get their rib cage to come down and to internally rotate and just say, okay, stay there and breathe. And it is so hard. And they can't, and they, they, everybody who does it gets this kind of anxiety or this angst. They're suffocating. They feel exactly. like they're Exactly, because we're asking you to move your rib cage into a position of exhale, which you don't do, and then inhale from an exhaled state, which you also don't do. Right. And your brain's like, F this. <laughs> right. yeah. Now, the, now and like we talked about, we are trying to change a subconscious thing, which means your conscious brain needs to be aware that we're instituting this change. So the fact that their brain is irritated and angsty and upset is like, perfect. We need your brain to pick up on the fact that we're instituting a change so this change can take hold. Right. Because if you're not aware of making a change, we can't make a change. Correct. Because okay, there's so, nothing to compare it to. So you have to have two, exactly. you have to, have two to compare. Yeah. And now your brain can make sense of one thing. Yeah. If only in one thing, it's meaningless because there's nothing to compare it to. Exactly. You can't get out of something until you know you were in something to begin with. Right. You know? right. So that's kind of the first session, just to kind of get them into that non-extended, more exhaled, deflated, rib cage internal rotation position and just get them acclimated to trying to inhale from there, part one. Yeah. And then start to getting into the, in the idea that you need to be able to go frontal plane side to side, rotation, and just kind of get better rib cage pelvic mechanics to start introducing what is normal from a non-Batman perspective, from a non- power lifting extended postural position. So I, I call it as the big four. I try to get them to change how they sit, stand, walk, and do stairs. So if I can get them to be more non-extended in that in those four things. That's like 95% of your day right there. Yeah. That'll give us a really good head start in being able to cultivate this two personalities perspective, you know everyday life and weight room kind of agenda. And, um, and so it, over the first couple of sessions, then they start to realize, okay, this is different. I see where you're going. Okay, fine. Then I'm like, okay, you got, sometimes it's like, you got to give me several weeks of not lifting weights. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not saying don't work out. I'm just saying, let's just do some body weight stuff, you know, because the, cause I'll have them do this bar squat thing. I'll do have them do like a half squat in this internally rotated rib cage thing. And I'll say, okay, stay there for four breaths. And their quads are on fire. Yeah, they are. And they're like, 
why are my quads on fire? I'm like, well, because you've never used them in this manner before, okay? Because here's the thing they don't know, is if you add the ingredients of Bruce Wayne to a Batman activity, it makes Batman stronger. Yeah. However, yeah. if you add ingredients of Batman to a Bruce Wayne activity, it makes you weaker, mm. okay? And so that's the whole agenda is trying to introduce them to, to have availability or, you know, well, that's a huge, you know, people talk about um, uh, availability, uh, having different responses available, uh, variability. Yeah. Variability, uh, yeah. All those yeah. things. Right. And so if, if you can't inhale with your diaphragm, it's impossible to have variability, period. Because you're going to be stuck in one state. You're going to be stuck in extension. Yeah. If you're busy breathing with accessory muscles because you don't know how to inhale with your diaphragm, you can't be variable. You right. can't get heart rate variability. Good luck with that. You can't get sympathetic parasympathetic variability. You can't get lateralization variability. There are several muscles you have then, it's impossible for you to utilize if you don't know how to inhale with your diaphragm. That's just, that's not even opinion. That's research fact. Yeah. So that's kind of the entry point. So then I'll, this happens invariably is we get through our stuff and we're moving along like, okay, now uh, go back and get some squatting, go and load the weights up and get to a regular workout. They're like, uh, I haven't squatted in like five weeks. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. Go ahead and just get back to it. Then the next time they come in, then they're even more upset than they were when I told them they couldn't lift the weights for a couple of weeks. They come back in, they're like, okay, explain to me how I almost set a personal best by not touching weights for five weeks. Okay. The answer is we've added Bruce Wayne to Batman. Mm. We've added your ability, your variability of muscular performance from breathing to swallowing and chewing to walking. We've added variability in those parasympathetic, parasympathetic, parasympathetically driven activities. We've added that component to extension. Now it's that like you have the ability to do what you want to do from a powerlifting standpoint, because then here's the other big thing is if you can then leave your Batman skeletal position and breathing system in the weight room. Leave it there. In air, over the course of the next two days, you are now Bruce Wayne with diaphragm breathing, rib cage position, not in this extended sympathetically driven activity. You now have the ability to allow your Batman muscles to recover. Recover, yeah. It automatically means that your next workout is better. Yeah. Because you haven't, because you should not use your back muscle, you should not use your lats to propel you across the street when you walk. That's what the lats are for. Right. However, if you've been using your lats to walk, that means your lats don't get a chance to recover from the previous workout. Right. You shouldn't be using only your quads to cross the street. If you are, then your quads are now getting, not getting the appropriate rest they need to then handle the next squat workout, which means that you're going to compensate. You're going to, because that's all uh, an overuse injury is, is compensation. You've, right. you've used the structure incorrectly. So now you're going to compensate. You're now going to cheat because you don't have a choice because the muscle you want to strengthen is now too fatigued from walking the last 20,000 steps for the last two days. Well, now you can't use your quad the way you want to in the squat rack. Well, then let's get you to recover better. And, and that's really the re recovery is a huge word in strength. And you see it all the time. Oh, yeah. I, just, I, I, I don't chuckle. You know, knowing what I know now, you know, none of these people are actually recovering because no. they're stuck in extension. Right. You can't recover in the absence of diaphragm breathing, which means you can't recover if your rib cage is actually rotated. You can't recover if you have a flat thoracic back. You can't recover if you don't know how to exhale, internally rotate and drop your rib cage and then breathe in from here with rib cage three-dimensional expansion. If you can't do that, you cannot recover. So I didn't know what this leap of over excitedness if yeah. you can, so if you cannot do those things that you just said by default it means you're still in sympathetic overdrive exactly which means as far as your body's concerned you might be sitting in a meeting your body still thinks you're in the squat rack yeah as far as your brain your joint mechanics and your muscles are concerned you're still in the squat rack ready to lift the weight i don't know you're sitting in a meeting now, I know you are sitting in a meeting, but as far as your system's concerned, you're still in the squat rack. That's it, not recovery. It doesn't know that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah.
there's that's not recovery that is still lifting weights while sitting in a chair right so i didn't know what this whoop watch thing was until i had a patient about it's a it's a it's a tracking device that tracks it just tracks like heart rate and oh okay. and respiration rate and that kind of thing but one of the things they track is recovery okay so i'm not exactly sure how it tracks recovery but so i had this patient come in and she was like I know I don't breathe right. And the reason I know that is because my recovery on my watch tells me that I don't recover at night when I'm sleeping. I'm like, okay, cool. So then we do our stuff. And over the course of a couple of weeks, then she sends me a screenshot of her five day recovery according to her watch. So they, it's like red, yellow, green, red, no recovery, yellow, okay, recovery, green, great recovery while you were sleeping. Okay. So she had five consecutive nights of green recovery. And she was like, that's never happened to me before. So what her watch is telling her, now whether it's accurate or not, I'm not here to debate that, but what her watch is telling her and what she is perceiving is that she is getting five restful nights of sleep. And that means she's recovering because she's no longer sympathetically driven during the day, which means that she's not sympathetically driven at night, which means she can recover, which means that her subsequent day workout work, whatever it is, is now more beneficial to her. She can actually get done what she wants to get done because mm -hmm. she has properly recovered at night because she is not only sympathetically driven during the day. That for her was worth everything. Yeah, and, and even, so much better. Yeah, and even psychologically, knowing that yeah. you invested, you're like, oh my God, I actually slept. Like, now I'm not because people and as someone who's always who struggled with sleep for you know most of my life you get worried when you're not mm -hmm. sleeping and not recovering because you can yeah. feel it and you're like oh well, i'm gonna be so tired tomorrow this is terrible and it just creates anxiety because yeah. you know you're not resting and it just yeah. you just get stuck in this cycle of vicious tension anxiety and extension yeah and so one of, of her five days she had shown me like four of them were like right at eight or a little bit more than eight hours of sleep one of them was like five and a half hours, still had that optimal green recovery. Mm. And that's the thing that excited her the most was, I didn't get eight hours of sleep, but I still had appropriate recovery. Yeah. And I was like, exactly. And the reason is you're now able to not live as Batman in this sympathetically driven, extended, externally rotated, non-diaphragm breathing. You're not doing that during your day. Mm -hmm. <sighs> you can actually rest and recover which means that you can then translate that into your sleep and yeah. that that was the big deal for her is that she felt like she could still get recovery because she was like if i don't get eight hours of sleep I'm a, i got a problem well not if you can recover now i'm right. still advocating eight hours of sleep i'm just saying on the rare occasion you don't there's still recovery that can occur if you know how to do it yeah and uh that's an interesting point because i i wake up quite a few times during the course of the night. But I know when I'm recovering and in a, for me, a decent state of, you know, uh, parasympathetic state, uh, I'll wake up, but I'll just go back to sleep again. Like it's nothing like it's not, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm aware that I woke up. Yeah. However, and I might do that four or five times a night. But, it's, but the next day, I'm not tired. I don't feel tired, so it's not a big deal. Other times, I'll wake up four or five times, but I'll wake up in a state of agitation. Uh, different. It's a diff, you, oh, oh yeah. my body doesn't feel good. I wake up and I'm agitated. And it's generally coming from my visual system. Sure. Uh, I know when I don't have that right prescription, I'll wake up agitated. Sure. And I have everything, all this sensory influence you know, worked out properly, I'll wake up, but it's more like, eh, I'm up, well, now I'll fall back to sleep again. Yeah. I'm still waking up, but in two different states. For sure. That's, that's a huge, huge deal is to be able to wake up and feel like you're not already mad because you woke up. 